I've really enjoyed myself in my time here. And one of the reasons, I, 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 I really have a strong sense the gospel is alive in this place. And um, I get that one sense, or maybe the other, more recently in other places I've been. And I'm thankful when I'm in places where I sense that there is a real commitment to Christ and a desire to follow him, um, even in wearing that cassock. Uh, <laughs> I'm amidst churches in Phoenix, and I just love my brothers and sisters there. Um, but they know well that I'm very that uh, the liturgy is very thin. What they're doing in the midst of the uh, city there is phenomenal, but they need to work on their liturgy. And uh, I've, they, we have some Anglicans who are coming to MTC now, and. I love going there and love the liturgy. My wife and I walked away two weeks ago from an Anglican service. We said, oh, wasn't it good to be back and have a depth of liturgy? So one of the things, I mentioned that yesterday, that one of the things that is taking place in mission studies that I think is exciting is a return, and I would call a sophisticated return to Scripture. A desire to not simply base mission and decide you know what it is beforehand, and then what you want to do is you want to base it then on a few proof texts that fit your model, but to try to ask the question, what does Scripture say, and treat it much more holistically. And what I want to do this morning, actually, yeah, it's still this morning, isn't it? Yes, still this morning. Um, what I want to do is I want to unfold the missional calling of God's people in the biblical story, and I want to do so primarily in terms of blessing. Now, I don't know if you know it, but I think the first time we're told that the gospel is actually preached, it's preached by God in Genesis 12. According to Galatians 3 verse 8, we're told that God preached the gospel when he said that all the nations on earth would be blessed. And so blessing is one of the first images in scripture to describe whatever other image you like, salvation, restoration, redemption, renewal, reconciliation. Blessing is one of the first images that is used in scripture to describe what God is doing for the sake of the world. So I want to unfold that. And I would love to have done this in about two or three hours because there's just so much richness to this that I had to cut out. According to Richard Bauckham in his little book, Bible and Mission, he says that blessing is in the most comprehensive sense God's purpose for his creation. It's the way he made it and it's the way he's going to heal it and restore it. But the question is, what is blessing? I don't know the tradition you grew up in, but the tradition I grew up in, the word blessing was really cheapened, quite frankly. You said, bless your heart. And if you said, what do you mean exactly? Well, I don't know, but it sounds warm and fuzzy. It didn't have much content. It was just blessing. And so the word blessing really was, uh, you know, we used to share our blessings. And what did that mean? Well, anything good that happened to us. And so the word blessing really didn't have a lot of content. And the problem with that is, biblically, it is rich, and it is deep, and it is full. I have come to love that word. I've come to find myself within the story of the Bible continually returning to that word, and when I wrote my book, A Light to the Nations, I entitled it Blessed to be a Blessing, because I believe that was the central way of understanding the missional calling of God's people. And Baker said no, they didn't like that title. And I fought with them, and I lost. But I would have, if I had my way, entitled it Blessed to be a Blessing. So what is blessing? Blessing. Well, that word blessing, if you do some work on it, especially in the Old Testament, you'll find that this is God's purpose for the whole creation, but I want to focus especially on humankind within the creation. That is, God as a father wants his children that he creates to flourish. 
He wants them to flourish in relationship to himself, in relationship to one another, in relationship to the non-human creation within themselves. And he wants them to delight in the abundance of the creation. I think as a father, there's nothing more I wanted for my kids than for them to flourish. And when I would bring them home gifts, I want them to delight in those gifts. And now as a grandfather, I tell my kids, I think I might love those grandkids even more. And I want them to flourish. And I want them to delight, to find delight and, in, and enjoy God and enjoy his creation. Blessing is the gift of a father. The generous giving of a father so that his children might flourish in the creation. But it's also a relational word. In other words, you don't simply enjoy the gifts apart from the giver. We are to enjoy the gifts thanking the giver. And I think some of those scholars that have pointed to thanksgiving and gratitude as at the heart of what it means to be image of God are correct. Somebody has called gratitude the heartbeat of Pauline theology. And it's in Romans 1 that when human beings stop thanking God and honoring him that we start to see that God gives them over. There's a sense in which human beings delight in everything God has given them and then return thanksgiving and praise. But also the very word blessing, according to at least some scholars, has flowed, they said, from this generous giving in which we flourish and as we bless God, we are returning thanksgiving to God. But also as we are blessed and we bless God, we're called to look out and bless others. You see what a rich word, I mean, this is three minutes, but what a rich word this is. Delighting in God, delighting in one another, delighting in the non-human creation, living as we thank God and live in praise to God and living sacrificially, blessing others, allowing the generosity of God to overflow from us toward others. It's a great word. And we're told in Genesis 1 that God blesses the creation and that he blesses humankind. Nicholas Waltersdorf even says that there is no creation or cultural mandate as we've been taught. There's only cultural blessing. That God just blesses his creatures and invites them to delight in him and in the creation. And here is what I want to trace in terms of the missional direction of the biblical story. In the opening chapters, God blesses the whole creation and blesses humankind. But that blessing is replaced by a curse because of human rebellion. And, what ha- and God's mission then, he sets out on a journey in which he is going to restore his blessing to the entire creation, restore his blessing to the whole life of humankind by liberating them and the creation from the curse of sin. So he does so by choosing and electing one covenantal people and to restore the blessing of creation to them and through them as a channel bring that blessing to all the nations. So from the beginning, God's election and the covenant is meant for one thing and that's to deal with the problem of sin and restore the blessing that God intended for his creatures and his, especially the creature made in his image to be restored to what God intended. And so God chooses a people, begins to work in that people to restore blessing, and then he works through that people to bless the nations, indeed to bless the whole creation as we're told in Romans 8. So that's the story I want to tell. And I want to begin with Genesis 12, and it's hard to overestimate the significance of this particular, these particular verses in Genesis 12. Wolf, uh, uh, Old Testament scholar named Hans Wolf has written an important article on this, very technical article, but a very helpful article. And he just says, it's hard to un- overestimate just how important this text is for the trajectory of the entire biblical story. And what we see in the New Testament is that this is very much in the minds of the rabbis, including Paul, that the fulfillment of these promises that were given way back to the forefather Abraham have finally now come true. 
Let me just read for you uh, Genesis 12, uh, verses 1 to 3. They may be very familiar to you, but just in case they're not, I want them uh, in your memory as we begin. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I'll make you a great nation, and I'll bless you. I'll make your name great, and you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Probably you've studied this already in your Old Testament classes, but the book of Genesis is divided into two. The first 11 chapters is a universe, God is dealing universally, and Genesis 12 through 50, God is dealing with the patriarchs. And the first five sections of Genesis in 1 to 11, the second five in Genesis 12 through 50. And in that universal backdrop, we see that God creates the world and blesses it and rubs his hands and says, I do good work. This is very good. But we see that human rebellion messes it up and that it is now replaced by the curse. An interesting point that Hans Wolf notes is that the blessing and curse as a part of creation would have been very much in the minds of the readers as they read, and they would have noticed that there are five uses of the word, key uses of the word curse through Genesis 3 through 11 that correspond then to Genesis 12 where the word blessing is used five times. In other words, the curse that now comes into the world as a result of human rebellion that escalates and grows through Genesis 3 through 11 now is about to be changed as God chooses one man and has a particular focus and he uses the word bless now five times in response to that. He is going to restore the blessing of creation back to humankind, back to all nations, back to the creation. But he's going to do it through Abraham. And he makes a twofold promise. Now, some of you who read the uh, Old Testament theology might be thinking, well, just a minute, many scholars talk about a threefold promise. They talk about a people, land, and a blessing. And indeed, one of the most famous books on the Pentateuch, the theme of the Pentateuch, talks about those three. But I believe it's exactly right, as Gordon Wenham points out, that when you do that kind of thing, what you are doing is forgetting that God is making a people, giving them a land, and blessing them, and that's all part of the one package of blessing. And the second step is to bless all nations. And what we see when this promise is repeated to the patriarchs, it's repeated to every patriarch, it's, a, it's repeated in a twofold way. I'm going to bless you, sometimes give you the land, make you people, bless you, so that I will bless all nations. So there's a twofold promise, a two step program here. First, Abram is going to become a blessed nation. That is, the restoration of God's blessing and creation is going to be restored to him. But the ultimate goal is so that all nations on earth will be blessed through him. It's kind of like the Hebrew grammar is leading up to this climactic clause that the whole goal of this is not simply for your own sake. And this is what happened again and again in Israel's history. They forgot that election and covenant was not about them. It was not about them. It was about God's desire to bless the entire creation. Thankful that that never happens in our circles. But we can learn from the Jews who always saw their election and their covenant as simply privilege. Bill Dumbrell, in what I think is one of the better Old Testament theologies out there called Creation and Covenant, argues that you can't overestimate this text. He says, it is the theological blueprint for the redemptive history of the world. This is now what God is going to follow in, in unfolding his redemptive plan. This is the blueprint before he starts the building project. God then chooses, uh, we go through the unfolding of the patriarchs, the lives of the patriarchs, they go into Egypt, 400 years, and it opens in the book of Exodus. And the next text, and I've found this 
in a number of Old Testament theologies where they've moved from Genesis 12 to Exodus 19. And Exodus 19 shows, gives us a picture of how God is going to bring blessing to the nations through Israel. In Exodus 1 to 18, Israel is liberated from Egyptian idols to serve God's purpose. What we see in Exodus 12, 12, that God is bringing judgment on the Egyptian gods, and he's bringing them out and liberating them from that son of God, that, that one uh, image of God that served the Egyptian gods, the Pharaoh, and he's bringing them out from underneath that idolatry. If God's people are going to be blessed, they must be liberated from the idolatry of the nations. And so in chapter 1 to 18, the language of redemption, they are liberated from idolatry. But then we get to Exodus 19, and it's almost like I get the picture, I imagine in my mind, Israel saying, who is this God that's been gone for 400 years? And as he comes back, and what does he want with us? And why is he liberating us? And why has he done these amazing things for us? And brings them to Mount Sinai, and God says to them, Moses, tell Israel, this is why I did all that for them. This is what I have in mind. This is what I'm calling you to. In Exodus 19, we read these words. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings, and now I've brought you to myself. Now. Here's the job I have for you, vocation. If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession because the whole earth is mine. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nations. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. They are to be a priestly kingdom in the same way priests were to mediate God's blessing to the people. They as a nation were to be a priestly kingdom that mediated God's blessing to the nations. And the way they were to do that was to live out holy lives. That is, lives that have been restored to God become distinctive and show what it means to be fully human. They are to be a treasured possession, a priestly kingdom, and a holy nation. John Durham in his commentary in Exodus says, as he, after commenting on the significance of these three terms, says, Israel was to be a display people, a showcase to the world of how being in covenant with Yahweh changes a people. They were to say, look at us if you want to see what it means to serve the living God. And then finally, God gives Israel the law to shape them as a people. Now, I, I suspect in the Anglican communion you haven't got the same problems as we do in the evangelical church. But in the evangelical church, we've got a real prejudice against the law. We kind of think of it as legalistic, and we just have this negative view because we've often misread Paul, I think. And most, uh, so many of the people that I teach, they could never sing Psalm 119. Psalm 119 wouldn't make a lot of sense to them. And the law is not like honeycomb and sweet and delicious and wonderful. And yet for Israel, the law was the way of life. It was the way of blessing. It was the way of prosperity. And these are the words that Moses uses actually in Deuteronomy 30. In other words, God's law was saying, this is what it means to be human. This is how you live out the fullness of humanity at this particular time in ancient Near Eastern culture and history. In other words, this is what it looks like at this cultural place and this cultural time, the way of blessing, the way of life, the way of prosperity. My son-in-law did his PhD work on Deuteronomy and at the, for a portion of that time, he was living with us, and he was sharing with us how the law was so distinct from the law of the other nations. And he was constantly sharing with me these distinctions between Deuteronomic and Exodus law compared to the law codes of the nations. And it's just remarkable. But the thing that just always stuck in my mind is that the law codes in Deuteronomy always were protecting the weak, the poor, and the marginalized. And the law codes of the other nations were protecting the powerful, the wealthy, and the landed. And, a, and nothing's changed much, has it? But the law of God took care of those who were much more vulnerable. And if people lived them out, according to Deuteronomy 40, the nations would look and say, who is your God? And where did you get this law? 
that you live in such a righteous and a wise way. This is what Tom Wright says, commenting on the Israel's mission uh, and the law, giving of the law. He says that they lived this out. This is what Israel would do. They were to function as a people who would show the rest of humanity what being human was all about. In other words, they would be a people, he says in another place, who were called to model genuinely human existence. What God intends for humanity, what it tends for them to be blessed. And Dumbrell in his book, he says, and this is quite a remarkable statement if it's true, and I think it is, that the history of Israel from this point on, the rest of the Old Testament, is in reality merely a commentary upon the degree of fidelity with which Israel adhered to this Sinai-given vocation. How well would they be? How well would they function as a holy people and a priestly kingdom for the sake of the nations? And Wright then points out as well that to forget the aim of the covenant, that, that it's missional, he's talking about the missional people of God, to forget that the aim of the covenant is for the sake of the nations, is to betray the purpose for which the covenant was given. It is as though the postman, and in Phoenix I have a postwoman, were to imagine that all the letters in his or her bag were intended just for him or her. In other words, have we been given this blessing to imagine that it's just about us? Is this is as silly as a postman thinking that all the letters in his bag are just for him? This is the way I think we need to diagram Deuteronomy 30 or indeed the whole covenant dynamic that God is the king, covenants with his people Israel, and he gives them the Torah to live by. And if they will respond in faith and obedience, they will experience life, prosperity, and blessing. Those are the words from Deuteronomy 30. But if they respond in unbelief and disobedience, they will experience death, destruction, and the curse. And they're given this promise of blessing, but this warning that if they follow the ways of the idols of the nations, they will experience death and destruction and the curse. But if they live out in the way of God, they will experience this life, and then through that, they will be a blessing to the nations. If they live according to the law, away from the idolatry, they'll bless the nations. And Jeremiah 4, when Israel is falling away, he says to them, he says, Re return to me, Turn from the idolatry and turn to me. And he says, and if you turn to me and swear by me, I will then use you and turn to bless the nations. In other words, a way of one of our professors who teaches prophets for us put it, and he kept saying it like this. He says, why was God so hard on Israel? And the answer was, because the whole world was at stake. The whole world was at stake. He chose Israel not simply for themselves, and so God then places Israel on the land in the sight of the nations to live as a blessed people for their blessing and basically says, you're under surveillance of the nations now. But then there's the danger he warns them of idolatry. The danger is that your hearts, he, I think Moses said this before Calvin, your hearts are fabricator of idols and you will naturally follow the idols of the nations. Don't do it. Don't fall into the darkness of the nations. That was the danger. But we see Israel's failure beginning in Joshua running to the end of Kings, Israel's failure to fulfill their calling, their capitulation to the idolatry of the nations. Instead of being a light in the darkness, they fell for the darkness of the nations. And this is when the prophets come on the scene. And the prophets basically begin to warn them at first, but then as it, show, as it becomes clear, they're going to fall away and God is going to reject them. The promise is made by the prophets that he is going to gather, renew, and bless Israel again. There's going to be a new Israel that is gathered back, renewed, and blessed, and then the nations are going to know the blessing that God has promised. A number of places in the prophets use the language of the Abrahamic covenant to speak of you're going to be blessed and the nations then are going to be blessed through you when you are gathered, renewed, and blessed. And uh, one Old Testament Roman Catholic scholar suggests uh, that 
the language of gathering that is prominent in the Old Testament and then becomes prominent in the intertestamental period with three images of gathering sheep, gathering wheat, and gathering guests to the banquet table become very prominent in rabbinic imagery and then fill the pages of the Gospels. They said, it's incredible that you can look in Old Testament theologies and find nothing about this language, and yet it dominates the prophetic literature. So if you're looking for a PhD and want to do Old Testament, there's a, there's a theme for you. Ezekiel 36, to me, is one of the exciting texts. It's the one I like to go to, because it says, God says, I put my name on you so that you would be, I would be honored amidst the nations. You failed me, and my name is now profaned amidst the nations. But then he says, but I'm going to do something. And most commentaries I've seen Ezekiel miss two little words that are right there. It says, I'm going to do something through you. I'm not going to give up on you. I'm going to do something through you. He says, I'm going to gather you back. I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to give, put my spirit within you. I'm going to enable you to obey my laws. I'm going to restore you to what you're meant to be. And then the nations will be gathered in as well. Then the nations will experience the same blessing. And then he goes on in the next section to talk in chapter 37 after talking about dry bones in the next section to talk about how this blessing is going to come through a Davidic king who's going to be that eschatological shepherd that gathers the sheep in and then blesses those sheep and then, well, to use Jesus' language, gathering sheep from another fold into that, uh, into that fold. Psalm 72 is one of the places we find in the Old Testament among the prophets where it speaks of this king in David's line, this king who's going to be one of his sons who's going to bring that blessing. So Israel will bring blessing to the nations, but it's going to come through a Davidic king. And here's what they would sing in Psalm 72. Then all the nations will be blessed through him, and they will call him blessed. Well, that prof promise of blessing to Israel and then to all nations is finally fulfilled in Christ. This is the point, of course, of Galatians 3, but it's also the point of Matthew 1, Luke 2, and many other places, that the promise of blessing to Israel and then to the nations is finally fulfilled in Christ. But Paul does not reflect, in this text at least, on the historical way in which this takes place. That's found in the Gospels the way this promise finally comes to Israel and the nations. First, the Father sends Jesus to gather end-time Israel. I didn't make that point strong enough, but I should have, that in the prophets, it seems that first, Israel is going to be gathered. First, Israel is going to be renewed. First, Israel is going to be restored. And then, after they've been renewed, then God will use them to bring in the nations. And so Jesus announces that that kingdom has come. And the 18 prayers that Israel prayed three times a day always connected the gathering and the kingdom of God. Those two prayers were close together. And they would pray, gather your people from the four corners of the earth. And they would pray, send the son of David to usher in the kingdom. And so the announcement of the kingdom means that the gathering begins. And if you're like me, I remember sitting through a class at Westminster Seminary that convinced me beyond a doubt that the kingdom had already come but not yet arrived. And I got so sick of that language because I heard it again and again and again. And I was convinced. It took me about one month to be convinced of it. And then after that, I just hear it again. And I just thought, but why? And I never heard why. And I never heard how strange this would have been. I just... Oh, if you're a theological student, you just learned this. Well, it's so true that the Bible said that Matthew 12, if I cast out demons by the power of God, the kingdom has come upon you. But also there's a sense of the future where Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter then at that point after the judgment into the kingdom of God. In other words, there's this already not yet time period. And do we realize how nonsensical that would have sounded to the Jews? Let's suppose, I don't know if Travis is here, he's going to pick, pick me up at the airport yesterday, and Travis comes to Pittsburgh, picks me up, and he's supposed to pick me up, and comes back, and somebody says to him, well, did Goheen come in yet? And Travis says, yep, he's already here, but he's not yet arrived. 
they would look at you and say, what are you talking about? Yep, he's already here. He's here in the present, but he's coming in the future. What are you talking about? You see, this is what, this is what the Jews hear Jesus saying. But the purpose of this is gathering. And the rabbinic imagery of gathering, of, again, sheep to a fold, of guests to a banquet table, and of wheat into the barn, permeates the Gospels. Because this is the gathering, the eschatological gathering of Israel that is taking place. And Jesus himself says, I was sent to gather the lost sheep of Israel in Matthew. And he sends out the apostles, go only to the lost sheep of Israel. This is the redemptive historical chronology. Israel first. The gospels for the Jew first. And then it's going to be for the Gentile. And so the gathering begins. But then Jesus begins to form Israel to be a blessed people. In my judgment, this is one of the most important contributions Tom Wright is making to New Testament studies, where, he, where he's making a lot of contributions, but where he's saying that what God is, Christ is doing with Israel is restoring them to their vocation. They've forgotten their vocation. They're living in hatred, and they're despising the Gentiles. They want to kill the Gentiles, and all the views of the kingdom is Gentiles are going to be sent to hell, as one of the rabbis put it. All Gentiles, hell is their destiny. And Jesus is saying, Matthew 5 to 7 is a great example. Don't live like these other Jews. Don't live like this. What you need to know is you've been chosen for the sake of the nations and suffering love is to be the way you work out your vocation. You don't hate them. You turn your other cheek. You carry the load an extra mile. What you do is you love the Romans. You forgive them. You pray for them. And if you're persecuted, you're blessed because that's your calling. And so God begins to form this little group of Israel, this nucleus that he says to them, you're the kingdom. You're the flock to whom I'm going to give the kingdom. And so he forms this little community. He points 12, something that many other of the communities at that time did. They pointed 12, indicating this is the foundation of the new Israel. So the beginning of the new Israel takes place as Jesus points the 12, just like the 12 tribes of Israel, and this new Israel is being formed. And then, in his death and resurrection, he renews and restores them fully. In his death, as the substitute for Israel, coming to fulfill the role of Israel, he takes God's judgment on himself. Others had prayed during the time of the Maccabees, God, use me as a substitute and pour out your wrath on me so that Israel can be liberated from exile to do their work in the midst of the nations. And of course, no one was able to take that wrath of God. But Jesus takes upon himself God's curse and God's judgment. And when he rises from the dead, he inaugurates the new creation. And so we see in these two events the turning point of cosmic history. We see the death of Jesus defeat all the powers of the old age. And we see the resurrection of Jesus inaugurate the age to come. And now the kingdom of God, the resurrection life of the new creation has arrived. And Jesus pours out his spirit that now those who believe and follow are able to begin to experience something of that resurrection life and the new creation. And then he sends gathered Israel to bless the nations. Karl Barth makes a real strong point of this when he's talking about the Great Commission. He says, often we see the Great Commission in Matthew 28, John 20, Luke 24, ascending the church. He says, no, in the biblical story, that's not what's taking place. There are no Gentiles yet. It's not the new, what it is, is gathered Israel. And then he puts it in a humorous way. He says, in gathered Israel, he sends the 11, which by biblical arithmetic is 12. Meaning by that, the 12, the starting point of the nucleus of the new, the new people of God, they are the ones that are now being sent to bless the nations. And of course, we get incorporated into this commission, but this commission, if you want to even use that language, this sending is now Israel to bless the nations. So gathered Israel then is sent to continue the mission of Israel, uh, Jesus, uh, mission of Israel as it's now fulfilled in Jesus. And now there is what Chris Wright, what Johannes Blau and others have talked about, the great change of direction. 
that all of this, it's not the nations coming to Israel, it's Israel going to the nations, which would have been very strange. And now the people are beginning, the God's people are taking on a new form. They're non-geographical. They're multi-ethnic. They don't live in the land. They don't live under the Torah. They're going to be a people that have to live in all nations. A really strange kind of thing in redemptive history. But how would the nations actually be blessed? How would this be carried out? Well, again, against all expectations, the book of Acts says, this is how it's going to be done. This is how the story of the Old Testament is fulfilled. I'm not going to read Acts 111. I hope you may know it, but if you don't, at least I think you can still follow. The key to the church's mission is here in Acts 1. In the first five verses, three things are ta- take place. First, the resurrected Lord speaks to them. Secondly, he speaks about the coming of the Spirit. And thirdly, he speaks about the kingdom. Now, if you're a Jew, what are you thinking? If you're thinking resurrection, spirit, and kingdom, you're thinking the end has arrived, right? And so they ask the most obvious question in the world, chapter 1, verse 6, is now you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel, right? Well, he gives an answer. And you you have a decision to make here about how to read the text. There's two possible ways. One is, none of your business. You're asking the wrong question. Just get on with your job of witnessing. That's what a lot of scholars hold, that's what I held. I don't believe that's the answer. The other possibility is Jesus saying, yes, I am going to restore the kingdom to Israel, but in a way you never expected. In other words, I'm going to do it in a way that is utterly different than anything you ever expected. And so, yes, this is how it's going to take place. And so Acts, his answer in Acts 1, 7, and 8 answers this way. First, the already not yet is going to continue. It's not for you to know when the end is going to arrive. It's going to continue, and in the book of Acts shows the Jew first for the first eight chapters, and then Gentiles. Second, until the end does come, you are to be a witnessing community. You're to be the witness, do the witness, and say the witness. You're to be a witnessing community, witnessing to the kingdom that has come in Jesus Christ. Thirdly, you can only do this when you've received the Spirit, when you've begun to live out that new life of the resurrection and the new creation given by the Spirit. And the horizon of your witness is the ends of the earth. It's going to begin in Jerusalem, move to Judea, Samaria, on to Rome, and on to the ends of the earth in Sydney, Australia. Acts 2, we see what this church looks like, the shape of this witnessing community. First, they are devoted to these means by which this new life that God has given by the Spirit in the resurrection of Jesus, they're devoted to the means by which they receive this new life. And as they do so, they manifest in their lives generosity, joy, uh, uh, sacrifice, and power in ways that they are loved and respected by the people around. And we're told then that God adds to their number. Again, we look at that model and we say, yeah, we see that model. We don't realize just again how significant of a change was taking place here. The Acts is showing how this is being fulfilled in such an unexpected way. And this is how the nations are going to be gathered in, fulfilling the Abrahamic covenant. I spoke about this in chapel, and I suspect most of you were there. But here we have the first Gentile church. And like Jerusalem, it's, a, it's like the Jerusalem church, but it has this new added dimension of establishing these witnessing communities in every part of the Roman Empire. Roland Allen, good Anglican, right? wrote a book at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, where he just looked at Anglican missions and missions done from the West in general and says, we look so different than what Paul did. And he started being quite critical uh, in in all kinds of ways. And he wrote a book called St. Paul's Missionary Methods Are Ours. Then he wrote a book called The Spontaneous Expansion of the Church. And in there he examines the book of Acts and he says, what is it that enabled the church to gather in the nations? And he says three things. First, it was first and foremost the attractive lifestyle of the community. 
It was the church living out the gospel in the midst of the community where they found favor with the people and were drawn into that community because of their love and their compassion and their generosity. He says, secondly, it was the spontaneous verbal witness of unknown witnesses, people who pointed to Jesus with their words and says, this is where that new life is taking place. And then thirdly, it was planting more communities like this everywhere. In other words, the way God will bring in the nations is through these communities, and it's not simply going and evangelizing individuals, it's establishing communities so those communities can live out the gospel in the midst of all the places on earth. So their church planting, if you want to use that language, is the way God is going to bring in the nations. What begins to happen, and I started, as I really spent a lot of time on Acts during, I think, one year, I forget which year it was, 2011, I started to really resonate more and more with some of the scholars that saw Acts 15 as sort of this, this pinnacle climactic point in the book of Acts. I'd never realized the significance, and I don't think I can communicate as well as I'd like, but I'm going to try. What begins to happen is this. For 1,500 years, there's been one cultural form of God's people. For 1,500 years. So if you're in a church that says, we've never done it that way, well, the Jews said, we've never done it that way, and we've done it for 1,500 years, and God said so. <laughs> so they had God's authority for 1,500 years. And here is what they were feeling, and this is why it's so hard for us. What we have done is slotted religion away in the private realm, and we feel quite comfortable living in the United States. We don't feel any tension after all, there's a beautiful place to live. We feel very comfortable as Christians slotting our faith here and letting our politics and economics and so forth be driven by a different story. Not so the Jew. The Jew saw the Torah as God's way of life. And God dictated as the king how Israel, how his people were to live under his authority as king. And now there's this Johnny-come-lately Paul who's running around the empire, establishing all these communities, and say, look, you don't have to come under the Torah. Well, how do you not come under the Torah? That means you have to live under the authority of the Roman Caesar, who's a godless, well, he's claiming to be the son of God, claiming to be Lord, claiming to be Savior. He's claiming to be divine. You can't live under his authority. You have to live under God's authority. Of course you have to come under the Torah. Of course you have to come under the Torah. What is Paul talking about? And they could, this, these were people from Jerusalem pacified by Barnabas for a little while. And now they start following Paul around and saying, Paul, he was one of the original apostles. We know this in Galatians as Paul then writes an angry letter to those who are starting to believe these people. But now... What happens in Acts 15 is they finally meet. This is threatening to destroy the church. And as they come in Jerusalem and they meet, first of all, they hear from these Jews. Then they hear from Paul. I think I'm getting there. No, Peter. Or, yeah, I think it's Peter. Then they hear from Paul and Barnabas. And we often think of Paul as the real authority, right? The heavyweight? Nah, he wasn't. And then we think Peter is the second heavyweight, right? No, nah, he wasn't. They listen to Paul, they listen to Peter, and they're still thinking it through. But then the real heavyweight stands up, James. And James stands up and he said, Brothers, this seems to be exactly what the prophet Amos was talking about. And Amos, why did he choose Amos? Bachman has this beautiful article, he says, because it's the only text in the Old Testament that speaks of the coming into the Gentiles as Gentiles. In other words, every other text could be seen as, Israel, as Gentiles coming in and becoming Jewish. That one text says, no, they will be known as my people, and they can come in as Gentiles. And so James says, it seems that this is God's plan, that they come in as Gentiles, and the issue is settled. But now, God's people must live out their creational blessing, no longer under the shelter of the Torah, but now must find their way to live under the lordship of Christ in all the idolatrous cultures of the world whether that be United States or Canada 
or Nigeria or Kenya or South Korea or China. They have to find their way to somehow live under the lordship of Christ where there are other lords. In fact, the whole book of 1 Peter and if the, if, uh, the New Testament scholar Gottbelt is right, not only 1 Peter, but much of the New Testament is wrestling with this new reality. And he says, we don't feel this tension, so we don't see how these New Testament writers are helping the people of God live under the lordship of Christ in the whole of their lives in cultures where other lords are at work. Now we must live out this creational blessing not with a law of God telling us exactly how to live every dimension of our lives, but rather in the midst of these idolatrous cultures bringing God's word to bear. So Israel had been blessed as a culture amidst other cultures. We are now blessed as we live within a culture, as Americans, Canadians, Kenyans, Nigerians, and so on. And so the, the gospel then begins to take multicultural, multi-ethnic form, embracing all those good things from the culture, but somehow trying to stand against the idolatry that twists all those things. And so what begins to happen is that what, what Newbegin calls a missionary encounter, where there's danger and that danger is always realized where to some degree the people of God will slip into the idolatry of their nations and not be good news. But there's opportunity as it embraces the different riches of the various cultures of the world. So we find ourselves living at the crossroads between these two stories, these two lords, these two authorities, living as Americans in the biblical story and asking, how do you be faithful and I would love to stop and tell a bunch of stories on this, but I think the more we start to realize, maybe I should just tell one. A man was, uh, uh, was working in middle management in a multinational corporation. He came to my doctoral advisor and he said to him, what do I do? He says, my multinational corporation is basically raping the non-human creation and creating poverty and injustice everywhere. He says, if I pursue profit, which is their bottom line, if I pursue profit, I'll keep my job, but I'll contribute to this kind of injustice. He says, if I don't, he says, I'll get fired. He says, what do I do? How in the world do I live out under the authority of Christ over economics and business when there's another Lord at work here in my company? And he struggled in pain. And I could tell a lot more stories, but the more we seek to bring our vocations and our lives under the authority of Christ in all of life, the more there's going to be tension. I mentioned this this morning, Acts 28. Rome is not the ends of the earth. Never is, never was, and in the ancient literature, that's often been a mistake to see the book of Acts ending at the ends of the earth in Rome. It's not. But the abrupt ending I spoke about is this literary technique that becomes an invitation to come be part of this ongoing mission that will continue today until Christ returns. Brian Rosner... Australian New Testament scholar says the ends of the earth is not in fact a reference to Rome. Acts 1.8 anticipates the vast expansion of the mission through Acts and beyond. The gospel is to be spread throughout the entire world. And in effect, Luke finishes with this literary technique with a subliminal message to be continued. And I want to add with you, the reader, as a participant in this story until Christ returns. We hear that God's creational blessing that we are to embody and preview now is going to fill the earth. Isaiah says, See, I'll create a new heavens and a new earth. They will be people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants after them. In the last chapter of the Bible, we're told that blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. God finally is going to restore that blessing to the creation. But until then, we're called to be a people that live it, speak it, and do it, and show what blessing looks like. I'm not sure how long I've gone, Grant. That's probably very convenient. Um, I'm coming near the end, because I have five priorities, and I'll, I'll, maybe just uh, I'll go through them more quickly without stories, and you can ask, ask questions. Five priorities, as I would put it. Number one, 
We need, as I mentioned this morning, vital congregational life to nourish the blessed life as a preview of the end. Um, I just heard, I was just at a church planting conference somewhere, and I heard a church planter talk about how every second or third Sunday they take it off and it's no longer worship, they do service in the neighborhood. I think it's wonderful to do service in the neighborhood. But if they keep that up, they're going to gradually dissipate the life by which they serve through the love of Christ. We need our congregational life. And yes, find times to serve. But, find, but make sure we keep those times sacred where we hear the word of God, where we take the Lord's Supper, where we fellowship together, where we pray together, where we worship together. This is essential for a missional church. Secondly, we're called to foster the life of a distinctive community amidst the idolatry of Western culture. What would a distinctive community look like in Western culture? I'm going to give you a real quick list. I'm going to give you probably 10 things. I'm going to go through quickly, but I have probably about 30 or 40. I've done this with many books of the Bible that I preach on. And what I'm doing when I do this is constantly remind myself that ethics are not abstract. We're always living it out in a particular context over against particular idols. And so what would it look like? A community of self-control and marital fidelity in a world that is saturated by sex in every area. A community of truth that looks to the truth with kind humility and gentle boldness. I think humility and boldness are the two things that are desperately needed together in a world of relativism and suspicion. A community that knows God's presence in a secular world that doesn't believe he exists, and if he does, he's up there in heaven. A community of generosity and contentment in a world of consumption, or I'd like to say a world gone mad with consumption. Living with generosity and contentment. 1 Timothy 6, if you're interested. A community of thankfulness in a world of entitlement. Things that you deserve. Maybe it's my age, I'm approaching retirement, I suppose, at least age-wise, I don't think I am, but I see all these advertisements I think are directed at men my age when I'm watching football or something. They'll say to me, you deserve a good retirement. You deserve to retire with all of these benefits and on and on, trying to scare the stew out of me because I don't quite have enough money and I'm going to run to them real quickly. But they're constantly telling me, you deserve, you deserve, you deserve, you deserve. And we hear this so much we start believing it. We're entitled. We're entitled to this. And in a world of entitlement, we need a deep thanksgiving. One of my practices, believe it or not, is every time I pay taxes, I thank the Lord. I thank the Lord for everything I've given and say I gladly give this. I'm living better than most people have through history. Learning that we're not entitled to anything and yet enjoying the goodness and grace of God, be thankful. I promised I wasn't going to say anything. A community committed to the important issues of our globe in a culture of apathy and indifference. A A community of justice in a world of economic and ecological injustice. A community of self-giving love in a world of selfishness, narcissism, self-gratification. I think if the church just lived this way, (laughs) just this one, it would be incredibly powerful testimony. A community that fosters depth of character in a culture of superficiality and where image is what matters. A community of compassion in a world that has been numbed by overexposure to violence and tragedy, especially through the media. A community that uses language positively. Think of James here, the book of James. Uses language positively in a world of destructive and trite communication. My son-in-law says that he thinks that's will be people, that his generation is going to be judged for the time that they waste on social media and all kinds of things with trite communication, things that don't matter. A community of joy 
in a world dominated by a frantic and hedonistic pursuit of pleasure. There's a, something in the contemporary testimony of the Christian Reformed Church that says, pursuing pleasure, we lose the gift of joy. Pursuing pleasure, we lose the gift of joy. And then finally, technology makes us stupid, I think, sometimes. And a com- being a community of wisdom in a world of proliferating knowledge and information technology. Now, sometimes it does it in silly ways, but other times more profound. I just think of my friend who wanted to come and see us. He's 10 minutes away, north of us in Phoenix. He plugs in Mike Goheen's address, and he starts, and he's heading up to BC. And he's going, because he plugs in the wrong address, he's going for two hours before he realizes it. Now, what were you thinking? He went 10 minutes away. Or another friend of mine who came to pick me up at the airport and says, Mike doesn't have a cell phone. How are we going to get in touch with him? How, how in the world? You know, he, I'm, I'm picking them up. And there I am waiting for them. And they said, how did you find us without a cell phone? I said, well, I looked at the gate number. And I looked at your thing, and I, here I am at the gate. And they go, I mean, the, it makes us stupid. But sometimes in very profound ways, those are silly ways, but often our technology... There's there's this one beautiful poem of a woman that says, she says, information is showering down upon us, but then she changes the, through technology, then she changes the image and she says, but we have no uh, loom to weave those threads of knowledge into a fabric of wisdom. Isn't that a beautiful image? To weave those threads of knowledge into the fabric of wisdom. We could go on and on. A third thing we need to be deeply involved in the needs of our neighborhood in mercy and justice. I was involved in going to a church that was dying, only older people, very small, ready to kick the bucket and actually close down, almost did. Went there with a friend of mine and together we started work. We saw that church then thrive and flourish and grow and plant another church. One of the most exciting experiences of my life. And one of the things, one of the turning points, there's about three or four turning points, but one of them is when we had somebody do a demographic study of our city and come back, and he said to us this. He said, did you know that within five steps of your front door this way and five steps of your front door this way, there are two burning needs that nobody's meeting? We had no idea. Over on this side was a bunch of people that were mentally handicapped but were sufficiently able to <clears throat> excuse me, to live by themselves. <clears throat> And so they were living in these apartments and had incredible needs. And then over here was a group of, uh, that was just full of immigrants. And so what we did is we mobilized the churches, the few people had to do, start meeting those needs. And what we found that within six months, the church was full of these people and they brought a whole new fresh flavor, sitting at the front and saying, oh, I call it kinds of stuff you're not supposed to say in a dignified worship service. And saying those kinds of things and loosening others up and, you know, shouting amen at the wrong times. And it, everything changed. When they, and then people that had very different color skin and very different accents. And all of a sudden this Dutch congregation, some of them couldn't take it, all of a sudden had a very different look. And it gave us more opportunities simply by going to court and helping these immigrants, uh, you know, navigate the difficult Canadian bureaucracy, and so on. But to be deeply involved in the needs of our neighborhood, I think, is one of the essential starting points. We need to be equipped for organic evangelism. What I mean by organic evangelism is being able to share the good news in ways that really meet needs. I'll tell this quick story of a pastor in the northwest of the United States, and as he was a he was a well-known pastor of a big church, an evangelical church, and he was getting his hair cut, and he was getting cut by a gay hairdresser. They both know who each other were. They were feeling very uncomfortable. And the pastor said, how am I going to break this down? So he says, what kind of world would you like to live in? And the guy says, well, I'd like to live in a world where there's no famine, where people can eat, where there's justice. I'd like to live in a world where there's no war and pain. And he goes on describing it, and he says, I'd like to live in a world also, and this really bothered him, where people take care of the creation. He says, people don't take care. They're ruining, the, they're ruining this world. And my friend says, well, did you know that's what the Christian faith is about? And the guy said, no, it's not. He says, it is. He says, no, it's not. He says, I know Christians. They just condemn me I, and tell me I'm not going to heaven. And he says, well, that's what the Christian faith is. The Christian faith is God made the world like you just described it. 
Our rebellion against him messed it up. But he set out on a road through Israel and now through Jesus to heal that. And Jesus coming back, and when he does, it's going to be like you're just talking. There's going to be no more famine. There's going to be peace and so on. The guy said, kept saying, no. He didn't believe him. And finally, he said, okay. He went home. And he told his partner, he says, we're going to church on Sunday. His partner says, what? Have you lost your mind? He says, no, we're going to church on Sunday. He says, well, where? He says, to this, that church? We're going to that church? He says, yes. And here's what he told his partner. We heard the story later. He said, that was the first time, he says, I've heard good news from Christians. Isn't that sad? But we often are working with people working on the ASU campus and think, figuring ways to bring the gospel where people really are thinking in terms of need and then addressing those rather than our canned presentations of the gospel that often are not even understood. And then fifth, we need to establish congregations uh, that are, sorry, establish congregations where there are none. Let me see if I can go back. In other words, we need to be concerned about missions to the ends of the earth. Be involved in our, in, in our part in missions that takes the good news and establishes congregations where there are no congregations. I think there are lots of ways to do that, and I think lots of ways to be involved, but I'll leave that there.